Hi, and welcome back to the Dietitians and Nutrition Support channel. A few months back, I had the awesome opportunity to attend the Food and Nutrition Conference and Expo, and as well as seeing all the amazing things that they had at Fancy this past year in 2019, I also got to catch up with some awesome dietitians who are super brilliant at all things nutrition support. So I took a few minutes to ask them some questions about electrolyte management to kind of help us wrap up our electrolyte series. I thought it would be helpful for any of you who are looking to manage electrolytes electrolytes in the future, in your own personal institutions, um, to try and get an understanding of, you know, what it might be like if you're starting out, how to get privileges to be able to manage electrolytes, what kinds of things you should do to help make sure that you're ready and prepared um, to go forth and manage electrolytes, as well as some information about resources that could be helpful to you. So thank you so much to Ainsley Malone, Beth Taylor, and Ann Coltman for all of their help with this video, and I hope you all enjoy. Uh, my name is Beth Taylor, and I am currently a research scientist at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. However, before that, I spent almost 19 years working in the Surgical Intensive Critical Care Unit, uh, primarily working with patients on tube feeding and TPN. And I'm Ainsley Malone. I'm a nutrition support dietitian at Mount Carmel Grove City in Columbus, Ohio, where I work primarily with patients who need primary nutrition. I also move clinical. My name is Ann Coltman. I'm a general manager of food and nutrition services for Trinity Health, currently stationed at one of Loyola's hospitals in Melrose Park, Illinois. So for my institution, for parental nutrition management, it's we have a nutrition support team. So we have several dietitians that write all the parental nutrition orders in the facility. Uh, this includes calories, protein, lipids, all the electrolytes, any additional insulin or H2 blockers. We still, we have a agreement where we can write that and enter that order and pharmacy will make that order. A physician does tag on their signature within 24 hours. So I actually, in the state of Ohio, do not have order writing privileges for parental nutrition, something we are working on legislatively with our Ohio advocacy folks. But in my facility, I work closely with pharmacists and we manage parental nutrition together. Sometimes, depending on our workload and how many PN patients we have, I will create an entire formulation and the pharmacist will enter the order. Sometimes I do macronutrients, sometimes I do electrolytes. It just depends on what's happening for that day. And just to be clear, in our facility um, in Missouri, Dietitians have uh, privileges to do enteral nutrition because parental nutrition is considered a drug. And I think a lot of people will find this. The pharmacy boards of the states will prohibit uh, someone without a, a medical license or a, a license to administer drugs to write the order on their own. So that's why we went the route of not trying for that, but for setting up an agreement for that we could write it, get it started, get it compounding, and they would co-sign. And that's true in Ohio. The Ohio Pharmacy Board does not recognize dietitians as anything beyond recommenders, but we are working legislatively to change that and to focus on a, a type of consult agreement so that following consult we would be able to order and manage parental nutrition. So in my most recent account, we had to gain PN privileges that were previously owned by pharmacy. And the pharmacist who wrote the orders was not specifically PN trained. He was sort of like a home self-taught kind of pharmacist. Um, so when I came in, I sort of initiated the conversation with my chief medical officer about how dietitians are, are likely more competent and more skilled in that area and that the order writing should be more of a partnership rather than pharmacy specifically owning that. Uh, so over the course of time, um, the, the order writing went from being strictly pharmacy owned to being a split service between pharmacists and dietitians, which was helpful so that I could start mentoring and training dietitians in how to write PN, um, but also give my more experienced staff the ability to utilize their skill and feel more engaged with their jobs. So it, it was challenging. I mean, the first time you're taking over managing electrolytes, it's a different view. You have to make sure that you're taking a total view of the patient. Uh, more beyond the macronutrient requirements of your patient because you have to be aware of everything else going on that could affect their electrolyte balance and because you're going to be working within that situation. And also the other thing I think that's challenging uh, when you're authoring uh, parental nutrition 
is like in our institution, we write for a 24 hour bag. So when I'm writing the order that contains electrolytes that has to be in by 2 p.m. today, it's going to hang at 8 p.m. tonight until 8 p.m. tomorrow night. So I have to be a little bit of a guru and kind of think, where is that person going to be 36 hours in the future? I would totally agree with what Beth just described. When we went to a 24-hour bag um, about 15 years ago, that's when we started managing all of the components of the PN bag. And so it was a little bit of a, of a challenge because it wasn't something we were used to doing. We were used to primarily providing recommendations for the physicians. And we kind of took over the process of managing and ordering. And when I mean we, I mean myself and other dietitians and the pharmacists. So it was something that we weren't quite used to. And it did take some time to become familiar and then uh, develop some comfort level and confidence. But basically, you start somewhere and you begin to learn and gain that confidence and that skill and being able to um, anticipate, as, as Beth described, what your patient may require based upon what they're doing clinically and what they have done. And it, it really becomes, um, more, you become more comfortable with doing it the more you do it. That was terrifying. I felt like I was in charge of human life because I was, and it was super scary. So um, I spent a lot of time learning from people that knew what they were doing and trying to write as many orders as I could. So I would do a lot of practice ordering and then have a more experienced clinician look over the orders. And then uh, I was really fortunate to have people that would take the time with me every day to talk about you know, maybe why a decision was great or why it wasn't great. And then, you know, there was also, they let me have a little margin of error. So I could see sort of like a, a very minor impact that maybe was unfavorable, but not dangerous so that I could really learn about the minutia of managing all of those components of the I would say get a uh, handy dandy pocket, a little pocket book on acid base and understand acid base and understand um, for the electrolytes things that could cause alter, uh, uh, altered electrolytes. So you have to be aware of if it's something that you're doing within the parental nutrition or if it's happening because of blank. For example, if they're on a medication that is potassium wasting and you up your potassium in the parental nutrition and that drug stops, then you may have too much potassium in the TPN. So it's really kind of uh, a good idea to have, if you now you can look at up-to-date or other things, but really to have something maybe in your pocket initially to know what normal levels are, what could cause abnormal levels, and what are different conditions and drugs that could affect electrolytes. And I would certainly add on to that. There are a lot of resources out there from webinars, a lot of basic webinars to more advanced webinars that really allow you to, to uh, develop skills along the course of your expertise. There are um, some published resources like workbooks. There's a parental nutrition workbook that actually goes through patient cases for both um, macro and micronutrient evaluation and order writing. So I think just if going through all the educational opportunities and then combine that with what you're doing clinically, that will really help help you gain that uh, expertise and that confidence level. Absolutely. Uh, connect with people. Find people that are willing to help you. And in my experience, every nutrition support dietitian that I've worked for or worked with or has worked for me wants to help train people. You know, I don't want to be a nutrition support dietitian forever, and so I want to help train. So ask people and they will help you. Put yourself in a situation where maybe you go above and beyond to learn a little bit extra about how you can write PN for patients or how you can do maybe an extra rotation in nutrition support or critical care um, because those dietitians personally and I think my experience is that I love mentoring people and I love students and interns and dietitians that want to go that extra mile and I'm always more than willing to, to put in a little bit more effort to help those people. Well, I know that dietitian nutrition support has some great resources and usually has a lecture that they'll present on managing electrolytes or and also there's workshops at Aspen so you can learn live. It always is helpful if you can go in a situation where you can learn live so you can ask questions. I think uh, online things are great but it doesn't always give you the opportunity to ask questions. Um, the other thing is to attach yourself um, you know once you've got some of those books and resources and think you've got a little bit of knowledge is talk to a mentor where you work. I learned a lot from my clinical pharmacist in the ICU and for understanding drugs 
because it's a whole new world, but it's an exciting world. I mean, we're geeky, right? All, all our deeds are a little geeky. We like math. So it's an exciting place. But I'd say uh, look for a mentor. Look for uh, a live class where you can ask questions and get a few resources. I would echo everything Beth just described. I think finding a mentor or a, a, someone that you can work closely with and help help guide you as you're beginning to gain these skills would be, would be just fabulous. And also some of the resources, Aspen has a parental nutrition order writing workbook. They also have a review course that includes electrolytes and acid-base balance and does go through cases, which I think that's one of the best ways to begin your process of developing skills is to uh, work with different types of patients through either directly or indirectly through educational events. So I think all of those opportunities will really help you gain some skills and confidence. I know I had a mentor, a uh, uh, yeah, nutrition support nurse, who helped me when I was a baby and taught me so much. So it's that's I think a huge all of us have yeah. started with someone to help us. We all didn't yeah. know what we didn't yeah. know. In that's the right. Beginning. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So I always try to utilize um, whatever whatever I can mostly find in the support line articles. I feel like those are written um, for clinicians by clinicians, and I feel like they're easy to read and easy to understand. And that's how I help teach PN to other people because I think it makes sense. Um, but really, my most valuable resource has been humans. You know, so the connections I've made with people um, or the dietitians that I've worked with. You know, like I just pick up the phone if there's a patient I have that's messy or complicated, or they have one, just pick up the phone. And maybe work through it on your phone because I think you can only learn so much from a, a book or a, a study guide, those kinds of things, but um, real in-person learning is the most beneficial of a writing hand. Right. It, I think that it uh, it's, it's a little bit challenging, but it's also very fulfilling as a clinician uh, because you really have an impact on that patient's outcome. If you can make some managements with their electrolytes such that they don't get in trouble. So a lot of what we do is preventive work, right? So by being in the know of their disease, let's say you have a high output ostomy and you know that, that in that uh, output they're losing a lot of sodium and so you're going to put sodium back in the TPN and it be maybe an abnormally high amount outside of what normally goes in the TPN. You may have physicians saying, are you crazy? But then you can explain to them, hey, if I don't do this, then you're going to become hyponatremia, hyponatremic, this is why. So I think that you really have an opportunity by learning to manage electrolytes and, and then doing it well to keep your patients safe and actually to have better outcomes. So that's, that's really fulfilling as a clinician. 100% agree with what Beth just described. And the safety aspect is one mm -hmm. thing that we can really contribute. I know, for example, we review our patients' electrolytes every morning, and you know sometimes they're spurious values, and you have to recognize that and understand when you see a potassium of six. You know you have to look, you know what's what else is happening, and if their other values don't reflect renal dysfunction and they don't have a lot of potassium in their in their formulation, perhaps there was too much blood sample um, in you know blood drawn up, and there's a spurious K. And we've actually seen instances where. A nurse has acted on that and so we intervene as quickly as we possibly can because that would be unsafe Absolutely. to give someone you know insulin glucose and insulin to drive what they consider a high potassium but truly isn't so I think this gives us an opportunity as we gain that expertise to provide safe care and promote the best outcomes for our patients which is obviously what we want to do absolutely yeah we all have those horror stories where um, the, the blood Straw was contaminated with the TPN, but the young residents or nurse didn't recognize it. So just like Ainsley is talking about, they go to treat it and they can cause harm to that yeah. patient. So it's a lot of really quick getting on the phone and letting them know, hey, we need to repeat to make sure that's not contaminated draw. Uh, and I think you, Ainsley brought up a key is that we're dedicated to looking at those every day. That's going to be on somebody else's list, but it might not be top priority. Where for the, the nutrition support dietitian who's writing TPN, that is your top order, right? So uh, you usually get to it first. Hmm. I think, you know, for me, it really made me feel like a much more valuable member of the team. I felt like, you know, when I was working in an academic medical center, residents had no idea what potassium, how much potassium to give a person. You know, a person would have a K of 2.8 and they 
give them 20 MEQs and think they had solved the world. So I think for me, it's been so valuable to, to prove my worth as a dietitian, you know, as a member of a medical team. Um, and I think that that personally has been extremely fulfilling and that's why why I like owning all the components of parental nutrition, including